Good morning and happy Halloween. Thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the pre-countdown status briefing for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-133 launch. Joining me today is Steve Payne, NASA Test Director. Good morning. And Kathy Winters, Shuttle Weather Officer. Good morning. We'll hear from our panelists and then take questions. Steve? Thank you. Well, I'm proud to be here today to bring you status on our upcoming countdown for the uh, launch of Discovery for on the STS-133 mission. I'm here to represent the team that's been working so hard to get Discovery ready to fly. Uh, this is going to be Discovery's 39th and final flight, and it's going to be bringing the permanent multipurpose module up to the space station, as well as the express logistics carrier number four and the Robonaut uh, to the space station as well. We expect a lot of interest on this one, and we expect a very good turnout for launch countdown. Uh, work is currently on schedule as we prepare Discovery for launch on Wednesday afternoon. We completed early this morning our, in our flight pressurization of our on-orbit uh, control system tanks and the main propulsion tanks, and all went well. Uh, that is behind us now. We resolved our remaining issues with our nitrogen quick disconnect poppet valve. Uh, it turns out it was a ground support equipment valve upstream that was providing too much pressure and not allowing the poppet to close. We isolated that uh, with another valve upstream of that, and we're able to close the poppet, and the leak is now behind us. So those r issues that we were having are now resolved, and we're pressing on for our call to stations at 13.30 this afternoon. All right, uh, call to stations, like I said, at 13.30, we'll begin the clock at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll get it right into final checkout and configuration of our avionics control systems. Uh, we'll begin preparations for loading of the fuel cell reactants. That begins uh, the preparations tonight. We'll be clearing the pad at 6 o'clock Saturday morning, uh, do our pyrotechnics checks, and then go into reactant loading at 1130. Uh, the pad should reopen at about 6 p.m. on Monday evening, and we'll begin offloading 180 pounds of liquid oxygen from our uh, reactant tents to, to get our appropriate flight load. That adds about four hours to our countdown schedule. This is why it's a little bit longer than typical. A check out of our orbiter and ground communications network is planned for Tuesday afternoon starting at about 13.30 or 1.30 p.m. local. It's followed by final flight crew equipment stow at 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. By 7 on Tuesday evening, uh, the rotating service structure will be retracted and we'll begin our final crew module configuration for load. Uh, just before midnight on Tuesday, we're looking at the countdown clock to resume its count at T-11 hours. Then we'll begin final loading preparations and begin clearing the pad just after 1 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday. Uh, earliest tanking time is at 6.27 a.m. on Wednesday morning. We expect about three hours of tanking. The flight crew should arrive at the pad just after noon on Wednesday. This is a space station mission, obviously, and it's a 10-minute duration window, approximately, and it opens at 3.47 on Wednesday the 3rd. We always target the middle of the window, and there are some seconds adjustment for a day of launch parameters. We have opportunities from the 3rd through the 7th of November, so that gives us five days, and we have our typical uh, four attempts in five days scenario we can use if we need it. Uh, we have, on the 3rd of November, we have both Flight Day 3 and Flight Day 4 rendezvous opportunities, so we can use either of those if we need it to. That would add about three minutes to our launch window. And we have that every other day, starting, today, uh, starting on the 3rd and, and then every other day from there. Uh, we have through the 7th uh, to launch. There are, uh, starting on the 8th of November, we have a beta angle constraint, uh, which doesn't allow us to go dock to the station due to thermal constraints. Uh, after that, uh, there are a number of other constraints. There's a small window of opportunity early December, should we need that. Our pad hold time is uh, plenty adequate. We have uh, seven days of liquid oxygen hold time, eight of liquid hydrogen. That's outside of our, our launch window, so we don't have to worry about doing any top off or reaction, uh, reactant offload during the count. It's an 11-day mission with one day contingency and two weather contingency days should we need them as well. Our end of mission is currently planned for 9.59 Eastern on Sunday, November the 14th. And uh, so far, it's been a remarkable flow for Discovery. Uh, she's been an incredible vehicle, and she caps a long and distinguished career uh, with this particular flight. She's always amazed us with everything that she can do, and we expect this flight should be no different. And we're looking forward to launch on Wednesday afternoon. Thank you. Kathy? Well, we are uh, going to be watching an upper-level low over the next few days that will be dipping down into the area of western of the western Gulf of Mexico. What that will do here for us on launch day is draw some moisture up from the south 
And as that occurs, we'll just be a little bit concerned about low cloud ceilings and also um, having some showers within 20 nautical miles of the shuttle landing facility. So with that, we do have a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. Now, if we happen to delay a day, uh, the weather becomes much more problematic. It looks like that frontal boundary is going to be pushing down into the area of central Florida, causing more concerns for showers and even possibly a thunderstorm uh, in the central Florida area. So with that, uh, we did increase the probability if we happen to delay 24 hours up to a 40% chance for um, for Thursday. So uh, right now, though, looking like just 30% chance on launch day of uh, violating constraints. Let's go ahead and look at the satellite picture. We do have Hurricane Tomas we're keeping an eye out for. It's moved through uh, the, the uh, Lesser Antilles and is now moving into the, uh, the Caribbean, and it's a Category 2 hurricane. Um, it's forecast to, uh, by launch day, be south of Hispaniola and still be Category 2 at that time. The Hurricane Center is expecting uh, that the storm will just continue to march towards the west-northwest. Now, at the end of that time period, the models tend to want to pull the storm a little more northeast, but uh, as that front moves through that I was talking about for Thursday, um, as it pushes in uh, to that area, it'll draw that storm northeast, likely. Um, the furthest east I think it would come, at least right now, so far the way it looks, it would be the, the southeastern portion of the Bahamas uh, moving northeast. So it doesn't look like it would be a direct threat to Florida. Uh, we'll watch it to see if it's going to increase the seas for the SRB recovery area um, at the end of the week. I'm actually just more concerned that the winds behind the boundary will do that uh, for Friday as they're returning. So overall right now it doesn't look like that storm is going to threaten our launch date or uh, be an issue for um, Florida at least right now. But we do continue to monitor toward these because we know how unpredictable sometimes they can be five to seven days out on the forecast. So uh, let me go ahead and show you the Hurricane Center's forecast for Tomas. Uh, you can see that track that I was talking about bringing the storm into the area south of um, Hispaniola uh, and making a slight turn to the north at the end there. And again, at that point, the models, uh, most of them have the influence of that trough affecting the storm, pulling it northeast. So it would likely be under a lot of shear as it gets under the influence of the trough as well. So it would likely become extratropical as it moves off into the Atlantic in the long range forecast. Let's go ahead and get into our forecast for launch. Our tanking forecast still looks good. Uh, we do just have some scattered skies in the low levels with the high ceiling in the area. We expect to see um, winds from the, the east-northeast, 10 peaking to 15 knots, and temperatures right around 74 degrees. Good weather overall for tanking. Just went with a slight chance of violating constraint at 5% in case the front happens to move along a little bit more quickly than expected. For our launch forecast, uh, overall the, the sky conditions look good in the low levels. We do have, expect a ceiling on and off around the 9,000 foot area. Winds will be from the east, 11 peaking to 17 knots. The models have toggled around quite a bit on the wind direction, and so we're keeping an eye on that. But right now, so far, it's within constraints, and there's a chance of showers uh, in the area. Uh, overall, a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. SRB recovery looks good overall with uh, seas just a little bit high at 5 to 6 feet. In that area, winds from the east 12 to 17 knots. Um, again, I'm more concerned for them as we get into Friday and that front moves through and the winds will pick up and that could increase the seas in that area. And we'll be briefing them tomorrow morning for SRB recovery. For Space Flight Meteorology Group's forecast for the abort landing sites in the U.S., the weather does look good both at Edwards and at Northrop Field. And for the TAL sites, we do have three good TAL sites on the first day with uh, no significant weather issues. If we do happen to delay 24 hours, this is a day that we think we'd be mostly influenced by the front coming into the area. Uh, we do have a chance for showers on this day. Also, thunderstorms could be in the area, mainly over in the Gulf, but anvils could stream in for those thunderstorms. Uh, the tops, of the, the high clouds that come off the top, those can be a triggered lightning threat. With that, we have a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. The abort landing sites in the U.S. remain good on day two. And Spaceflight Meteorology Group only has a slight concern at Zaragoza, which have visibility to come down to four miles in fog. If we do happen to delay 48 hours, so the front should move through Florida. Again, this is the same front that would be pulling Tomas off to the northeast if, this, um, if Tomas was uh, in that location down in the Caribbean that the Hurricane Center is forecasting. And at this point, uh, we'd mainly be concerned about uh, low cloud ceilings in the area. And also, winds are getting a bit strong. And if they turn from three five zero, they're about the, the ground wind constraint is 27 knots, but it starts to drop as we turn more northerly. So from if it came straight from the north, it would be down to 23 knots. Forecasting right now a peak wind of 21 knots. So I did increase the probability on this day to a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. 
The abort landing sites, again, in the U.S. still look good on, on the third day. And we have similar concerns at the Tau, at, the, at Zaragoza, one of the Tau sites, just a chance for four miles in fog, but overall two other good Tau sites, both at Moron and Istris. So we'll keep an eye on Tomas, but right now it doesn't look like it'll be a factor for launch. And our main concern will just be if we happen to delay. So right now, launch day, we have a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. If we happen to delay 24 hours, that's when a front will come into the area and we have more concerns. And we'll keep watching that trend. If it looks like the models are going to keep timing it out that way, we may have to increase that 24-hour delay number if, uh, if they come in line better. Right now, there's some differences on the timing of that, so we're just keeping it at 40% for day two. But day one, still looking good. Thank you. We'll now take questions. When the microphone comes your way, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. We'll start with Bill. Hi, uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News for Steve. Uh, would you, um, th what, did, what did the troubleshooting show where the problem was? I was confused. Was it both nitrogen and helium or just helium? Well, initially we'd had two different issues with, uh, with our quick disconnects, one with the, with the nitrogen side and one with the helium side. Uh, the one that was a long pole, the one that took us a long time to resolve, was the one on the helium side because it required venting down our tanks and repressurizing, and that just takes a long time because you have to do it slowly to allow the thermal conditioning to happen. For the nitrogen tank, it's fairly straightforward. It's a quick process. The size is about the tank is about the size of a softball, so it takes a couple of minutes to fill and empty. Um, we thought it was a quick disconnect valve, and it's I believe you saw one of these earlier. It's the same kind of quick disconnect valve. Uh, there's a little poppet inside that's held open by pressure, uh, and when the pressure goes down, it closes again. The valve that was supposed to stop supplying pressure to it was providing too much and it couldn't close properly. So we just went upstream and closed, closed the gas off to that one so that the pressure would bleed down and the QD could close. And it worked very well. well I guess what I was asking was, is, are you saying then that there really wasn't anything wrong with the shuttle hardware? It was an issue on the ground side that you guys just didn't see. Well, once you pull it out, it's hard to, to go back and, and determine that. Uh, we changed it. It turns out it could have been both or it could have been just one. At this point, we don't know once we take it out. But uh, the valve we had originally had been there since the initial build of the vehicle, and we'd never had any issues with it. Uh, and that was back in the early 80s, I believe. So, so. Okay, so, and so now everything's buttoned up, and you guys are pretty confident. Everything else up. comes up, you'll get there. Correct. And we're going to spend the rest, of the rest of the afternoon putting the area back together, disconnecting all the ground support equipment, and putting the doors back on. So that is behind us, fortunately. Are there any other questions? Um, over here, please. Uh, Denise Chow for space.com. Um, just a quick question to clarify for Steve. Um, the repressurization, has that been completed or is that ongoing today? Of the? Of the um, engine pods. Well, the, the, yes, all the repressurizations are complete at this point. The, the helium tanks were repressurized and they were done early this morning. Uh, the nitrogen tank we repressurized as I was getting out here, and the pressure was holding fine. So uh, we believe that's, uh, at this point, done. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, um, Bill again, please. Since I promised Kathy a, a question yesterday, no, I'm kidding. Uh, what is SMG saying? I mean, you guys always look at launch weather, and I know that you, you fold some of what SMG says, but. But uh, I know they're listing constraints for all of those days in terms of chance of showers and all that. How right. confident are they, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, we actually coordinate our forecast, and that probability does cover their constraints. So we talk every morning um, to make sure that our forecasts are all lined up. And the main reason why we're keeping the number at 40 percent for day two, even though it lists a lot of violations, is because the uncertainty that we have in the forecast and the trend, the changing of the trend, we just wanted to trend it up. Now, tomorrow, if it continues to look as it looks on the models today, with that front more solidly where it is, consistently, I should say, more consistently, then we're going to bump that number up again. We, we considered it today for that day two. Um, but uh, but we didn't quite do it. And, and on the first day, they listed a chance of, of a shower, so that's why we have the number at 30%. So we, we do talk and coordinate all that, and well, yeah, it's all into consideration. I'm sure that, that they're as confident yeah. as you are. That thanks what yeah, we've, we've been talking each morning and saying, well, so hopefully, hopefully one of these days the models will all line up, and, and we expect that to happen as we get closer to launch day. Thanks. Ken, you had a question? Thank you, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. Uh, for Kathy, is there any particular time of the day when these showers are more likely? Is the afternoon the most likely time? 
But usually we get an easterly type flow that are actually more likely in the morning, but the moisture is increasing in this case in the afternoon too. So, so it's a little, probably pretty even on how much chance we have of showers in the morning and showers in the afternoon. So we have it listed on both the tanking and the launch forecast. So usually morning time would be more, and then as you get in the afternoon, the sea breeze will actually squelch these a bit. But in this case, with that moisture infection, there's still a chance for a shower. Now as we get in the overnight hours, we would expect them to increase again. The water gets warmer than the, than the atmosphere, and so you get a little more instability and you get a better chance for showers in the overnight hours when you have an easterly flow pattern. For Steve, you mentioned um, that this valve had not been changed on Discovery since it was built. Um, curious about uh, Atlantis and Endeavor. What's the history there, if you know? That's a good question, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> we, can, we can look that up and get it for you. Okay. If there are no further questions? We'll conclude today's pre-countdown status briefing. As a reminder, the countdown begins this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's not on NASA television. The next NASA TV briefing will be tomorrow with the pre-launch news conference, which is expected to begin no earlier than 11 a.m. Eastern. For more information on the STS-133 crew and mission, please visit www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you.